Sit down, sit down, sit down. I got to tell you, you are so beautiful to see this place, to be standing in this spot. You are so beautiful. The people of God in the body of Christ is so beautiful. And I want to say to you, I got a lot to say today about all of that. But I just want to tell you how much we love you and so thankful for you. I can't imagine my life without you. That's how much you mean to us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I have gotta, I've got to sit down today. I, I'm not allowed to stand too long. So I'm trying to be obedient. Hallelujah. Before I can dig into this stuff today, and I'll get that in a minute, i got some pretty big news to give you today. This is a big weekend for us at the Kelly House. And yesterday... My son did something pretty incredible. Would, would, would Corbin and Amaris please stand? Show them the ring. Show them the ring. There you go. Show them the ring. My wife, I was so excited about this. I was up at 6.30 in the morning on Saturday. <laughs> and we drove out to a spot my son found out by Pilot Mountain. Didn't even know the people, but he walked up to their house and asked if he could use their property. And they said yes. And so we went out there and we set up some stuff. Yeah. And many of you don't know Amaris yet. Uh, she was living in Virginia during this time. They've been dating since January, long distance relationship. And, and so, but now she has left her job. She is looking for a job in Winston-Salem now. She's moving this way to get everything set up so we get to know more about her. We're proud of her. She, got a, she graduated Regent College there, got a degree in ministerial counseling and I'm looking forward to seeing God, what God's going to do. Amen. It's going to be awesome. So sometime in the spring, we're going we're to do all the I do's and the I don'ts and, and do that. But we're so proud of Corbin, Shane, Kelly, and Amaris Babbitts. Thank you, sir. Just chunk one. Oh, I almost did it one more time. Look at that. I got it back. <clears throat> Today, I am, I'm going to preach a little different today. Um, first of all, whew, it feels so good to be on this platform at this moment. It's been nine weeks. It's the 10th week. I counted up a minute ago trying to find out what, how long has it been. And uh, just to be sitting here, standing here with you, is just an incredible honor. And so I'm going to try to give you a little history of what happened over the last few weeks and, and just talk to you for a few minutes. This will be a shorter than normal sermon. Don't worry, they'll get longer later. Hallelujah. But, and what, what you mean to us and, and what God's brought us through. So, I want to start off with this simple, th this concept. I want to speak today about the value of your tribe. The value of your tribe. Who you surround yourself in life truly matters. Some people will pretend to care. Some folks will say things like, well, I'm praying for you. God bless your heart. 
Others will try to use you for what they can get or what they want from you. But then there will be some friends who stick closer than a brother. It is difficult to go through tough times without real friends. How many have been through a tough time in your life? Just let me know. How many can recall immediately who was by your side during that time? Those faces, those names, those people, never forget those people. It, that's where you really find out what your relationship is. You know, we can all be together when everything's great. But when you're flat on your face and not sure what to do next, the people that will pick you up, those are amazing people. That's a tribe you want to have in your life. And I am so thankful for this tribe. You guys have meant so much to us these last 10 weeks in this journey that we have been on. I want to thank this amazing pastoral staff, Pastor David, Pastor Kelly, Pastor Chester, Corbin, for doing a phenomenal job. I want to thank the dream teams, all the leaders of all the dream teams for just making this place run. Amazing. There are, there, are time, there are some churches, if this would have happened to them, churches would have been miserable and messed up for a long But this church kept moving and kept moving and kept growing. That's an incredible sign of an amazing tribe. Amen? And for that, I am truly, truly grateful. It means so much to us. Tough times are guaranteed in this life. Some folks get this Christianity thing all confused. They think if they give their life to Christ, they'll never have any problems. That's not in the Bible anywhere. What is in the Bible is you will have struggles. But he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I will bring you through whatever you got to go through. That's what he says. So don't be surprised if you're going through something because that's called life. That's called flesh. <clears throat> that's called age. Called wait. Things are going to happen. Things out of your control are going to happen. People are going to hit your car when you're innocent. Amen. You're going to have moments that happen to you that you didn't invite into your life. It's called life. But our God says, I will always be there with you. It's a promise He makes. There's even times where what you deal with is demonic. And if you don't believe there's demons, that's fine. I, you can live there. If you know there's angels and you got to know there's also demons, come on somebody. It's a pretty much understood thing. And demons have an assignment, intentional assignment to destroy your faith. If they can't destroy you, they won't destroy your faith. That's just part of the deal. That's what Satan's plan is. It's his whole thing. Well, what did, he, what did he do when he entered the garden? He tried to communicate to Eve to change her faith from it being in God to being in herself. You could be like God. It's a shifting of faith. You're going to have moments in life. There's no way around it. You're going to have moments that even the Lord says to, to Satan and says, have you considered my servant Job? That's a tough one to talk about. But think about for a few moments that Job was such a blessed man. He was more blessed than anybody else at that time. He had walked in incredible blessing. Children, finances, cattle, the whole nine yards. And Satan is walking around choosing, trying to find someone he can devour and torment. But because God's blessing a hedge of protection around Job, he couldn't touch Job. And so Satan says, well, who, who can I mess with? And God says, how about my servant Job? Could you imagine that conversation? And God removes the hedge of protection so that the enemy could go in and begin to destroy. Now, God knew who Job really was. He knew that Job loved him not because of the blessings, but because of their relationship. 
And in the end, Job had more than he ever had in the beginning and lived 145 years of healthy life. He got to see his great-great-grandchildren grow up. Blessed beyond measure. But at the time, the enemy was allowed a chance to go in and torment. Now Job, he loses his kids, he loses his cattle, he loses his finances, he loses his homes. He's covered in his horrible boils. There's one part in scripture where he's taking broken pieces of pottery and he's scraping the boils off of his flesh. We're talking about true torment. Torment. And in that, Job found out who his friends were. As a matter of fact, when you read about this point in Job, it's, it's verse 3. By the time you get to verse 9 of the same chapter, just a few verses later, six verses later, he's been through so much hell that his own wife says, Why do, do you still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. Could you be imagined being married to that woman? Thank God you didn't ask that woman to marry you, Corbin. Man, could you imagine your own spouse looking at you saying, why don't you give up, curse God, and die? It's only been nine verses. Six more verses from the moment the hedge was pulled. And you're ready to curse God and die. She literally couldn't deal with the understanding of what he was going through. His friends, he had three buddies, if you want to call them that. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, brilliant names, by the way. Their only answer to all of Job's problem was, surely you must have sinned, Job. You did something so bad that this was brought upon your life. It amazes me how those people still exist to this very day. Just because someone goes through something, they start going, what did you do? Where did you mess up at? Who did you, what, how? And the blame game begins of how we're going to discover what your problem is and what you did to create it. There was even people, when Jesus was walking around healing people, there was a blind man. The Bible says he was born blind from birth. And there were people that said his parents or he must have sinned in the womb. That's impressive. That's impressive. The concept of you must be to blame for the problem you're going through right now. Now, the, no doubt, we have personal responsibility in the decisions we make. And that we have to consider some of the things we choose to do. But there are times in your life that what you're going through is not because of you. There's a bigger thing at stake. I don't know how loud I'll get today if I get loud at all, but just hang with me. His three friends. Now, let me talk about some friends, a couple of friends that, are, that you want in your life. When Peter was put in prison, Acts chapter 12 and verse 5. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. The church began to pray so heavily without ceasing that while Peter is in the jail cell surrounded by guards, the next morning he's going to be taken out to be martyred. The Bible says an angel walked into the prison and the chains fell off of Peter immediately. The angel says, stand up, put your clothes on, we're leaving. And the doors open of the prison open up. He goes out that ward, goes down the next ward, the next gate opens up. Then he goes to another ward, that gate opens up and he finds himself standing in the middle of the street. Set free because of the prayers of the church praying without ceasing. You want to have a tribe that knows how to get a hold of God, that God then sends angels on your behalf to get the chains off of your life. You want those kind of people around you. Listen, if all your friends don't know how to pray, you've got the wrong friends. Uh, but they're fun. Yeah, but they're useless in war. They cannot help you when the battle begins. They don't understand what you're facing and what you're fighting. Surround yourself. And if they don't know how to pray, start teaching them how to pray. 
because you need, they need to know what it means to be able to pray and pull on heaven. Another set of friends you want to have in your life, this is found in Exodus, this is a great one. Uh, Joshua, uh, uh, as led by Moses, goes out and fights Amalek. And as, he's, as the Israelite army is fighting Amalek's army, Moses says, I'll stand on a hilltop and raise the rod of God, the rod that he waved over the sea that turned into blood, over the ocean, over the Red Sea that parted for him. That same rod, and he's holding it up. But the problem is, a man can only stand there for so long. And they begin to notice that whenever Moses' arms would come down, that the Israelites start losing the war. So two men, Aaron and Hur, run up to him. And they took a stone and put it under him and said, sit down. And then each one that on each side held up his arms so they could have victory for the army of Israel. You need people that whenever you are finding yourself in a place of weakness that won't come to you and say, what have you done wrong? They'll say, have, have a seat for a minute. Let me hold your arms up. Let's make sure we get victory in your life. Let's make sure God does something big in your life. Who your tribe is really matters. <clears throat> it matters the people in your life. Man, what a powerful thing to think that Aaron and her would see the need and then run to it to solve it. They could have said, Moses, if you were stronger, we would have won. Moses, if you weren't so old. Hallelujah. Moses, if you were in better shape. But instead, they said, no, he needs our help. It didn't say how his arms are raised. Let's go raise his arms. And they ran up there and raised his arms. That's the kind of tribe you want in your life. Those people matter. When you're going through a time when you cannot pray for yourself, you need a tribe that can call down heaven to break hell's curses. It, this, this is real. There are times in your life when you cannot pray for yourself. Well, I thought you could always. Yeah, yeah, but there are times in your life when you try to pray for yourself and like my wife said last week, it was easier to pray for other people than for self. I remember many nights laying there in that hospital room and tried to pray, and it seemed like it just fell out of my mouth and onto my chest and hit the floor. I'm like, Lord, are you even listen to the word I'm saying? But start praying for someone else's need. Whew. There's just something about that connection in the tribe. There's something about that, that moment. We didn't, uh, we didn't ask for, matter of fact, we asked that people not come to the hospital because we didn't want to have a bunch of folks there. Not that we didn't want you to come, but we also knew that the hospital would probably would not be very happy with us had we let everybody come. So only a, few, a handful of people actually came to the hospital. But let me, let me tell you about friends, friends that you can have in your life. During that time, I had grown a nasty, large beard and neck stubble. And all you guys know that after a certain while, that begins to itch and hurt. And, and Dennis showed up twice, this guy right over here, with hot towels, razors, and shaved me twice in that hospital. Isn't that beautiful? One time he was doing it, and because of the drugs they were giving me, I kept falling asleep. I just lay in there trusting everything. Lord, go right ahead. <laughs> uh, one of my trustees, Robert Newman, popped in on me a couple of days. You know, and he saw things that another man probably shouldn't see. He had to help me back and forth to the bathroom a couple of times. And I got all kinds of stuff. I got hoses coming on my back. I got... All kinds of things attached, and I was like, Robert, I hope you're going to survive. He goes, no, I'm not looking. Just go ahead, Pastor. Just go ahead. <laughs> Anybody still be your friend after that? That's a friend. You know, there were, there were people who did, my, my, you know, my family. I, I, and before I can say anything else, you know, we, my wife and I both were down for, for almost two months, right at two months, unable to do anything for ourselves. And I just got to say, Hannah Michael Kelly. My daughter. That was an angel sent by God to care for her folks. 
you know, it's, it's a blessing to have kids that love you. In this day and age especially. And I'm so grateful, Hannah, for all that you did. Matter of fact, one time, I'll tell you something, something funny. We, about the third time we have to go to the emergency room, and we're all getting used to this thing now, back and forth. And, and my daughter, they put me in a triage room. At this point, I'm, I can't talk. My throat is swollen too bad to talk. And, and I I'm, 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 can't breathe, can't get air, my throat's all swollen up. And so we get in the triage room, there's two doctors, two PAs, and three nurses in the room. And my daughter goes, everybody listen up. <laughs> and they all turned and looked at her. And I'm laying there going, oh, what's going to happen, you know. <laughs> and she gave the breakdown for all the weeks prior of what was happening to me. And she named it off, boom, 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 boom. And then she said, if you have any further questions, ask me, get to work. <laughs> yeah. And they all went to work like, like she was there to be the boss for the day. So let me kind of give you uh, my testimony. That's really what my sermon's about today, my testimony. I'd like to have brought you something with lots of breakdowns of different words. That, that'll be later. But I want to tell you what God did. On August 10th, my wife and I got on a cruise ship to go on our 30th wedding anniversary. We had big plans. We we're going to celebrate. We we're going to go to Alaska on a boat. Let me tell it to you like this. You'll not be able to drag my cold, dead body back on a cruise ship ever again. <laughs> it just won't happen. And you'll understand why in a few moments. Now, if you love cruises, you go have as many as you want. I will wave for you from the shore. Y'all have a good time. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. We get on that boat, and within two days, my wife becomes so sick. I didn't know what was going on. She didn't know what was going on. And so she told you that story last week a little bit. And by the time I could convince her to go to the hospital on the boat, she spent two or three days in the hospital on the boat. Double pneumonia. The doctor looked at me and said, you almost lost her. It was that intense. And so a few days into it, I began to get sick. And so we both came down with COVID and then something else and then something else. And when we get off the boat, she couldn't walk. And so I had to find people that would, I, I paid people to push a wheelchair so I could carry four bags of luggage to get from the boat to the plane. And we got home, got to Charlotte, middle of the night. My son picked us up and got us home. The next morning was Sunday morning, and I wasn't scheduled to preach that day. I think I had Pastor Kelly or David, I can't remember which one of y'all was going to preach that day. I was, we were going to miss two Sundays. I've never missed more than two Sundays in 33 years of preaching, ever. And so I, I wasn't scheduled to be here that morning, but I woke up that morning, and my throat had swollen shut, or at least I thought it was shut. And I could only breathe if I would scream out and scream in, which is hard to do. That's how I can get air in and out of my body. My daughter grabs me up and takes me to the emergency room, and they're looking at me, and they can't figure out what's going on. They finally said it was what they called an edema, which is a pocket of air that could have gotten lodged in the back of my throat behind the lining of your throat. And so they sent me home with some steroids. Well, three or four days later, that pain and that swelling got worse to the point where for me to swallow, my whole body had to, had to be a part of it just to swallow, you know, you, your arms, your legs, everything had to move just to swallow some, just to swallow spittle, I mean, just nothing. And the pain was excruciating. So we go back to the hospital. Um, we get to the hospital the second time, and again on a Sunday, that to me is interesting. Back to the hospital again, and this time they start looking at it, and now they start talking about, well, you may have cancer, you may have tumors in the back of your throat, and they started giving me a list of all the stuff they thought it might be. And then they wanted to go in and do exploratory surgery. They were, I was being told, you may never sing again. You may not speak well the rest of your life because your vocal cords are going to get damaged. There were things that were being said over and over again. And I'm, I'm just laying there trying to swallow and trying to breathe. The throat was swollen. So they finally decided after three or four days or five days, or I can't recall now, that it was, had become an acute uh, acute um, tonsillitis, severe tonsillitis. Now, I didn't know I still had my tonsils, so that was interesting. 
had my adenoids taken out when I was younger. I thought they took all of it. No, they, they, they left the tonsils behind, apparently. I was like, I have tonsils? I don't know. And so they go to treating that. Well, I don't know if you've ever had that, but as an adult, you don't want to take your, and I asked myself, well, just take my tonsils out. Well, I tried to talk to them. Other people were telling everybody, and my throat was so swollen in my mouth that they couldn't see the back of my throat from my mouth. You couldn't look inside my mouth. Everything was so swollen. And so they talked about surgery, removing the tonsils. And the doctor said, you don't want to do that. You're 51 years old. That'll be a two-month recovery as an adult to have your tonsils removed. I said, well, let's not do that. So we get sent home again, this time with antibiotics, and I'm feeling, I'm feeling somewhat better. And so I even was even... I even was able to come to service on a Sunday. And man, to walk in here after, after four weeks of going through hell and walk in here, and boy, you're, the love in this place was just explosive. It was just so overwhelming. And I, to even try to talk, it was overwhelming to talk. And so I was so just moved by the, the, the love in the room and how much prayer had gone forth just for those first few uh, weeks. And, <clears throat> and I, I did something, which is why I know it was the demonic attack. Before I left on that trip for our vacation, I talked about the breath of God in us and the Yahweh. How the word Yahweh is actually the sound of you breathing. Yahweh. Yahweh. And, and this whole thing started right after that service that week. I come in here that Sunday and I'm just pumped. Man, it's so good to be in a room. I can't wait to get back in here and get back to work, and I said it again, you have the breath of God in you, and I breathe it out, <gasps> way. Monday morning, I wake up with severe pains in my right side, and I'm thinking I'm trying to pass a kidney stone. I've done that about 25 years ago, or something in that area, long time, so I know the pain. I am not going to compare it to childbirth, I don't think anything compares to childbirth. But I'll just say it's very painful. So I recognized what I thought was that same pain. So my family, you know, we, we like to do some natural things. And so my daughter then researches quickly, my wife and daughter, about concoctions you can make to help pass a kidney stone. And they whipped up nine different recipes into one drink. And fed that to me to whites. <laughs> There's a reason why I'm telling you that part of the story. But the pain in my side wouldn't go away. It kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And so finally I said, I think I gotta go back to the hospital. I'm not sure what's going on. We go back to the hospital again. This is now the third time for me to go back to the hospital in, in six weeks or five weeks, something like that. And <clears throat> I get there and they say, they did a CAT scan. And my throat was still not right. It was still swollen, but, but it wasn't as bad as it used to be. And now they say you have two abscesses in your right lung, which are, they were about a quarter size each, basically, about a quarter round. And the doctors told me, they said, now these abscesses are going to be there for six months or so. You're going to fight with this for a long time. So you're going to be on antibiotics for the next six months. Or, and they, they gave me a list, and I'm going, what in the world are you talking about? I can't breathe. It hurts to breathe. The abscesses are in my right lung. And it's just, it's very painful. And so I'm thinking, well, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. He said, if I come back and take a CAT scan one month from now, you'll still see both these abscesses sitting in that right lung. Now, I'm hearing all kind of negative things and, and stuff and stuff I don't want to hear. But the, but the problem is they don't know my God. <clears throat> and that really matters when you're, when you're facing this kind of stuff. So now, I, so they sent, after about three or four days, they send me home again after lots of IVs and things of that nature. They send me home with antibiotics and, and uh, uh, whatnots. I forget now. Anyway. And a few days at home, I start hurting again. But I, the pain never really left. It was still there. But I start, it's, just, it's just intensifying. And what's crazy is on the third day after being home, I pass a kidney stone. Those two drinks work. <laughs> so if you ever need to know, call my daughter. She'll give you the concoction they whipped up for me. So now I not only have abscesses, now I'm also passing a kidney stone at the house. So 
By Saturday, I'm having to, I have a CPAP, I sleep with at night. I look like Darth Vader lying in bed, quite, quite funny. That's been going on for many years. But I'm having to hold that CPAP to my face during the day so I can get air in. I can't seem to get air in my lungs. And I'm hurting. And then by Sunday, again on Sunday, I start having these coughing spells that felt like somebody hitting you in the back with a ball peeing hammer and knocking all the air out of your body. And so I, I would be sitting on the couch and a cough would come, and it would hit, and I would let out a cough, but never get to bring the air back in. And it would do it seven times in a row. And my daughter said, my wife said, it looked like I was floating in the air because my whole body would spasm into one just solid piece, and I, I was on the couch, but everything would straighten out, and I would be like this, complete in the air, cough, 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 and my head would turn purple because there's no oxygen coming in my body. So they decided to get me back to the hospital again. My sister, two days before that, felt impressed to send a, a box of little cans of oxygen to my house. And my son opened the door that day and saw this box on the ground and said, someone sent us a box of oxygen. Well, at that moment, my oxygen had dropped down below 80 in the house. And so my kids figured out, put the CPAP on your nose, get the air to force into you, and then it would hold the cans of oxygen in my mouth so I can get oxygen into my body. And that's how they got me to the hospital. They wired up the CPAP in the car and the cans of oxygen to the hospital, all the way to the emergency room. And I, and I used that in the emergency room until they finally got to work with me. Isn't it interesting how God would position something at the right moment? <clears throat> By the time I get to the hospital, my oxygen is in the low 70s. But I'm still somehow awake. And so they begin to work on me. This time they come and tell me, uh, what you have now is you have a collection of fluid that is built up around your lungs. And so we have to drain that off of you. So for nine days I stayed in the ICU uh, step-down unit, the ICU step-down unit, which by the way at Wesley Long Hospital, the ICU department, the ICU step-down department has amazing people working there. <laughs> amazing people. I bragged on those nurses and I talked to them every day. And they were some of the sweetest people. And I determined that while I was there, they were going to have so much joy when they walked in my room. Because I know there's lots of other rooms, there's no joy in those other rooms. And I wanted to feel at least a little bit of joy. And so I was always present enough to communicate to them and let them know that. It was, as a matter of fact, when they were talking about moving me out of the ICU into a regular room, they fought to try to keep me in the ICU. <laughs> they didn't want me to leave. But... So now they're draining, they drain four liters of water off of my lungs. That's two soda, two, two liters of soda, you know. That's a lot of fluid. So they got the hose in the back and they're draining the fluid and I'm having to lay there for days and days and days. I lost 35 pounds in that time. That's not the way I wanted to lose it. But now I'm 35 in, Hallelujah. This was also the time that I experienced something very unique. It was, and if you don't want to hear this part, you can close your ears. It was my first sponge bath. <laughs> now, I don't know whatever thought you have in your mind, but it's not what you think it is. You know, I, you know, I always thought sponge bath, ooh, you know. It's not that at all. And it happens at 5 o'clock in the morning. 5 a.m., I'm laying there, I got drugs in my system, I'm kind of awake, not awake, not really asleep, but somewhere in a place between, and I'm being flipped like a rotisserie chicken. <laughs> Things are happening to me that I have no control over whatsoever, and I just, and I, I'm getting tossed and turned. They remake the whole bed with your body in it. I don't make my bed when I get out of it. <laughs> flipping and flipping and cleaning, water stuff and sponge stuff, and I, I was afraid to even look. I just, I just kept my eyes closed. <laughs> Things was happening everywhere. <laughs> and when they finished, I looked at the nurse on my left, was the older of the two, and I said, 
how long you been doing this? <laughs> she said, long time, baby. <laughs> and somehow I responded with, well, I don't know if I should thank you, tip you, or report you. <laughs> And I still feel that way this very day. <laughs> they schedule me for a sponge bath every day. I got one more and said, I feel clean. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I am good and clean. I'll be just fine till I can get home. Take me a shower. <laughs> every day they schedule that thing. Whew, that was fun to talk about. <laughs> I got to breathe for a second. So now they're draining fluid off my lungs. And I'm going through this process of can't sleep, can't rest, nights are worse than others. I, I, and then they wake me up in the middle of the night, 3 a.m., one of the nights, we're fixing to give you a blood transfusion. Torment after torment after torment. Eight different sicknesses in this, in this two-month period of time. And now they're going to do a blood transfusion at 3 a.m. And I said, why? And they said, well, you're bleeding from the hose we got in your back. Looks like you're bleeding into the, we're not sure how much blood you've lost. We're fixing to come back in an hour, and we're going to do a blood transfusion. And I'm laying there saying, Lord, I don't understand what is going on. Why is this still happening? Can you imagine how many questions you would ask? Some of you have been in places worse than this. And you ask, Lord, what, why? What's, what's happening? So you start, you know, your flesh comes alive a little bit and starts saying, what are you doing? What, what have I done? What's going on? And you, but deep down, you still know you're fighting a spiritual battle. It's, it's representing flesh right now, but it's a spiritual battle. So I'm laying there for an hour panicking, and they come back in an hour later, oh, false alarm, you're good. Now, I don't know what made me go from you're getting a blood transfusion to you're good, but I think God has something to do with it in the middle of all that. So now we get to where it's up to me when I can leave that hospital, because now i got to start getting up and walking. i got to start trying to breathe without oxygen. So every night I had to put oxygen in my face so I could breathe when I was sleeping. Every day I had oxygen in my face so I could breathe. So now I'm trying to breathe without the oxygen. And I did that. I, got, I told them, take the pain pills away. Let me see what I can do. And so I began to try to breathe without oxygen. And that's a journey, especially if you've got to walk or talk. <clears throat> There's not enough oxygen in you to, to breathe and talk and walk at the same time. You can't do it. And so, uh, oh, I'll tell you one more funny story. I have a lot of these stories, actually, but I'll tell you one more. I'm in a hospital, and I have a 26-year-old daughter who's not married. And I'm seeing these young men walking around, <laughs> you know, PA on their shirt and doctor on their shirt. I think, well, you know, it's not a bad place to try to find something out, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm here, you know. So one of them was a young man, I won't say his name, I don't want to embarrass the guy. But one guy, a good looking fella, a PA, and I'm thinking, oh, talk to this guy what's going on you know and I said hey so we, we and I walked the hallway one time together as I'm trying to get my breath back and and we go we stop at the nurses station about eight nurses in there and I said hey you single <laughs> it's an odd thing for another man to ask another man I'm just saying and he kind of went uh, uh and he kind of muttered about it you know and I said well here's a picture of my daughter and I showed him my phone he went he went wow I said, yeah. Well, then one of the other nurses speaks up and says, oh, he's got a girlfriend. And I said, well, you're not, you're not the man I'm looking for. He said, well, why not? I said, because boys have girlfriends, men have wives. <laughs> you ain't a man. And I ain't messing with no boys. That poor fella's whole life changed at that moment. He didn't know what to say about that. After that, that moment happened, I had three nurses come to me for counseling. <laughs> I'm not kidding. They wanted to know more. One nurse was taking my blood, and I'm, I'm looking at her, and, and I start talking to her. I said, what are you doing? She said, oh, I'm getting married in 2026. I said, 26? She said, yes. I'm so excited about it. I said, well, why are you waiting so long? 
oh, I, I want to have a horse with a carriage. And, and she's listing all these fanciful things she wants to have for her wedding. And I asked her a question. I said, are you telling me, is this man the man? Is he the man? Oh, yes, he is the man. Then why are you keeping him from becoming a husband? What's your point in keeping your man just a man when he could be the next level up, a husband? And she's taking my blood. She goes, do you have to talk right now? <laughs> and I said, I, I never stop talking. And she said, can I come back? This is deep. Can I come back later? I said, sure. An hour later, she came back and sat down with me, and we talked again. I was amazed at all these wonderfully intelligent people, but don't have understanding of the basics. Uh, at that nurse's station, one of the women cried out and said, oh, you must want us to believe in marriage. And I said, you got a better plan? Because I can promise you the one you're trying ain't working right now, is it? Ooh, I'm going to move on to my sermon. Hold on, let me get back to this. I was, God was having moments. And so, I, and I'm walking, I'm trying to get my breath back, I'm hiking the, 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 the hallways, I'm trying to get my air back, and Pastor David showed up, how far did you walk today? I uh, walked the whole lap, you know, that kind of thing. So finally, we get down the last couple of days, and it's on Sunday, again, on Sunday. Two doctors come in, and they start talking to me. And I know, they're, I know they're meaning well. I understand that. But one of the doctors looks at me and says, okay, so let me tell you what you should do going forward. You should not preach for the next three to six months. You should not go to church for the next three to six months. You should not be around people. And she began to list these things off that go against everything that God has told me to do since I was a child. And I'm sitting on the side of the bed trying to breathe. My daughter's in the room. She's about to get up and slap somebody. I had to, stop. I had to calm her down. <laughs> and I said, I said, ma'am, I don't think you understand what you're telling me. I said, not only have I been preaching for 33 years, I said, this is an anointing and a calling on my life. You just don't set that down and stop doing it. And she said, well, I'm telling you, you should not do anything else. And she even started talking about choir singing, like you shouldn't be around a choir. And I said, man, we did this in 2020, we're not doing this again. And the room changed. And I told her, I said, I'm fixing to say some things you're not going to like. And I'm, I'm saying it more like, I'm going to say some things <laughs> that you're not going to like. It sounds really powerful. <laughs> but I told her. As soon as I leave here, and as soon as I can, I will be preaching the gospel immediately. Oh, that angered her. I was there three more days. She never came back to my room. The other doctor tried to play it off, and I said, well, you know, go your own way. And I was so aggravated because everything has been about, this whole 10 weeks, 9 weeks has been about, you're not going to preach again, not going to sing again, you're not going to be able to do these things again. I'm stealing your ministry away from you. And then to have a doctor get up and tell me, now you got six months where you don't get to do any of that. I've already had two months, enough's enough. I've had enough. You're not going to tell me that. And I know she means well to a certain degree. But when she got specific with choirs and church, I knew she had a different agenda. Mm, come on, somebody. And I basically, in a nice way, rebuked her. In a nice way. <laughs> and I was so aggravated by that, because yet here again, another attack on this, who we're supposed to be. Now, while she's talking and telling me what I'm not going to be able to do. My mind is going back to the prophetic word God gave me in 2011 about how there'll be a cloud of glory hit this place, how the highway will shut down, how the trees will be gone, how people start crawling up the hill to get to some place. I'm seeing all of that in the back of my mind. And now you're going to tell me don't be involved with what God's doing? I got no choice to be involved but to be involved with what God's doing. 
I've got no option but to be involved with what God is doing. I don't get to quit what God is doing. I don't get to walk away from what God is doing. I don't get to stay no more from what God is doing. If God is doing it, we're going to walk into it. We're going to step into it. We're going to see it come to pass, and it will happen. It is happening. Woo! She's telling me it's not going to happen, and I'm seeing what's happening. As a matter of fact, just a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night, we had two cars pull off the highway because they heard a voice. They didn't even know each other. Two separate women and two different cars. One woman said she was driving along, and she heard a voice say, go to that church. So she pulled off the highway and came to church, went to a class. The woman that was driving behind her followed her up into here. And they said, well, how did you find it? She said, I don't know. I was driving along. heard a voice say, follow that blue car wherever it goes. Don't tell me God gives a vision and doesn't supply it along the way. If God tells you it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Walk by faith. Expect it. It's taking place right now. This room is proof of what God is doing right now. And this is a second service. When those trees came down, when the state took them down, I went, oh, Lord, it's happening. We can see it. Let me tell you something kind of cool about that. We, we, we've been talking to the state. I've had Pastor Kelly call the guy to the state more times than he ever wanted to. Because them trees sitting right here, the ones that are left, right over there, that little spot. Well, we, we've had some things. We don't like that. We keep talking to them. And finally gave us permission the other day to go in and start clearing out the smaller trees. And I said, well, how small is small? <laughs> Cut out the smaller tree. But here's the thing about that. They used a word that we were believing they're going to use. They, they said, we already think that's your property anyway. <laughs> All right? So we're going to own that soon. And every tree, no matter how big or small, is gown. Because soon, there'll be a cloud of glory hit this place. Soon, every car will stop on that highway. People will get out repenting and making their way up the Soon it will happen. It's already happening now. So while she's telling me what I can't do, I'm seeing what's going to be done. And I refuse to let the enemy talk me out of a future he prom that God has promised me. I refuse to let the enemy can try to convince me that I cannot do what God said I should do. I don't know what voices you're having to hear or what you're going through. But I'm telling you, you get the right tribe with you. Mm. You get the right tribe in your corner. You will find a victory in every single situation. Whew. So the miracles are simply this. No cancers, no surgeries, no tumors, no loss of voice. Still have my vocal cords, nothing. God is still in the miracle working business. I walked in the doctor's office on Tuesday for my checkup. He looked at my notes and said, you shouldn't look this good. You're about three weeks out from looking this good. And I said, oh, yeah, I just walked up in there. Yeah, doc, I'm here to get my... <laughs> Why are you looking like this? Oh, we, I know a God that's bigger than diagnoses. And I got a tribe at my back. Woo! Let me just help you with something right now. If you're battling something, whether it be demonic or flesh, I don't even care. Whether it's sickness or something in your marriage, whether it's a struggle in your mind, whether it's fear, whatever it is. If you'll recognize the room you're standing in right now, you're surrounded by people full of faith that can lay hands on you, that can pray for you, and you will see a miracle. <clears throat> James, James chapter 5 verse 14 says it like this. If there be any sick among you, 
Call for the elders of the church and let them pray over you, anointing them with oil in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall see. this shirt every night in the hospital. The ones you anointed with oil and you signed your names to it. It was on my pillow every night. I rested my head on the fact there are people that I know that know who I am, know where I am, and when I can't pray for myself, they're calling on heaven to break hell's curses. There's a tribe that knows a situation. Lord Jesus. So I'm here today to simply say it like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all your diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so thy youth is renewed. Isaiah when the enemy comes in like a flood he said I'll raise up a standard against it I don't know what battle you're facing today I don't know what trial or testimony you're about to have but I want somebody to know something right now you don't have to have defeat you can have victory you're surrounded in a place that's full of faith and when we lay hands on you, we have the expectation that whatever it is we're asking in his name believing, we shall receive it. If you don't want to believe me, that's okay. But I'm a living testimony to what it looks like when people bind together and say, God, we're calling on heaven to break hell's curses. We know what it looks like to see miracles. We've seen them over the years by so many. So prayer team, come down. I'm feeling pretty good right now. Come on down, prayer team. Whew. I'm about to have an altar call in this place. But here's, here's, here's what it's about. Whatever's hurting, whether it be physical or spiritual, maybe it's your marriage or struggling, maybe it's your mind and fear has crept into your heart and you're operating more in fear than you are in faith. Maybe your body's been ravaged by something. Maybe the enemy sent it or maybe some decisions you made. I don't know. Here's what I know. We serve a healing God. We serve a way-making God. Well, what if I come down and I don't get it today? We'll do it again tomorrow. What if it doesn't happen tomorrow? We'll pray for it again the next day. For two months you've been praying for me. I am so thankful. Because I can stand here today and tell you God's a healing God. And I'm supposed to be on antibiotics for six months. Tomorrow's my last one. He's about to pray and he's about to sing and the prayer team is ready to pray. What, I don't care how big or how small, it doesn't matter. I want you to come down as fast as you can because somebody today is getting a miracle in your family, getting a miracle in your life. Come now, come now, come now, come now. Don't even wait. Don't even pause and think.
think about it. It's time for my deliverance. It's time for my healing. Make your way down right now.